Uh, okay, so the room is now filled with people, and in this round table, we will be uh, well. We will be discussing the trends in cybersecurity in the industry for dot zero. So we can say that cybersecurity will determine or will shape evolution of uh, connected industry in the future. It will also have a strong influence on the companies that would end up selling in Europe, and it would also have an impact on those companies that will not be in that in the market. In any case, it will open up uh, lots of opportunities for entrepreneurship and for startups. To discuss all those trends, uh, caused by um, cybersecurity. We have uh, uh, these panelists with us. I'm not going to read the bio of each of them because, well, that will take up the whole hour and therefore we will have no more time for discussion. So I would like to introduce them first, uh, fast, and please apologize me for not going through your bios. And as I say, just a couple of uh, uh, achievements. And then uh, they will have five minutes each for the presentation, and then we will move on to the debate. And uh, OK, so the first panelist is Ignacio Álvarez Vargas. He is an industrial engineer. He's got an MBA, and he's also director of communication area and uh, industrial cybersecurity in Siemens. He is the president of Profinut, Profinut, and for t he's got 23 years of experience in the sector. The second panelist is Ramon Suárez Alonso. He is an advisor of the European Commission and of the United Nations, and he is a lecturer not in one university, but in very many universities. And he's also president of the uh, Association of Galician uh, Factories. They have the accreditation of the MIT uh, in the US. And now, Eliane Jose Egozcue. He is responsible for uh, professional services related to cybersecurity in industrial control system and automation system. He works at the company S21SEC, and he is also a regular um, collaborator of uh, the European Network of Information Security Agency. He's been being in this world, in this sector, for more than 10 years. Angela, thank you very much for coming to Spain. Angela Senaro. She is the director of relationship with the industry of uh, CEBRIC, which is a consortium of uh, infrastructure of research in Eastern Europe. They have a long standing trajectory in terms of technology transfer, and she's got long experience in everything relating to open innovation. And now, Stefan Junestrand. Junestrand. I um, hope I'm pronouncing your family name rightly. He is a, he is a, a General Director of Tem Tecma Red. It's a company uh, that is located in Spain. You are Swedish, and you've been living in your your basis in Spain. He's uh, he's got a PhD. He's an architect. He's an expert in smart cities, and he's been developing his expertise, implementing his uh, expertise in Spain for the last years now. And now, Ignacio, five minutes for each. Of so sorry for this brief interruption as we're, we're finding the mouse. As it was said at the beginning when we opened, before we started with cybersecurity, I should like to mention what's going on with the industry. Actually, the, during the introduction, they said this is the fourth industrial revolution, even the fifth one. And actually, I agree. I don't know what number it is, but it is a 
industri an industrial revolution. And here's to blame. Who is to blame for that revolution? Well, it is as ourselves, users. And why is that? Because it's not enough what we get from producers, but we move from users to developers. As you see on the top of the slide, we want to have our own devices. What the manufacturer is giving us is not enough anymore. We want it customized. So I was saying, we want to have our own versions of the product. We want to have our customized products and devices, and we want to have them right now. So within a year, we want to change our computer, laptop, device, whatever it is. So what does it mean for the industry? That is quite an industrial stress, as you can see. So what is it that the industry needs? We need to find answers to what we users are requesting. So we need the industries to be fast track to be faster and faster in the time to market. We also need flexibility. We want it customized. So we need to make possible that whatever used to be large you know, batches now need to be customized items, but without forgetting that the cost has to be the same as with the batch production. Again, quality. No quality means that we sell once but not twice. And naturally, efficacy or efficiency. Naturally, this all comes with some cyber security measures, which in the end, that those replies that the industry is seeking now, we automation providers, we need to provide those answers. What about the trends in the industry? So it's not what we had seen before on the previous slide, but in the industry, we also need to consider zero accidents, no tolerance for accidents. So we need to achieve everything we've seen so far and no accidents on top of it. And we also need to reduce CAPEX and OPEX both, considering productivity as well, which in turn in the industry, this means that we need to have digitation, industry 4.4, oh, sorry, and smart data, etc. So quite a simple example that I have. This is one of our customers, Zarati. So if you see the production cycle for a given product from the very beginning when designed all the way to planning, production planning, engineering, implementation, services, and even if just tangentially back to the beginning, communication, digitation needs to be full thickness throughout the whole chain, meaning from this spot, I need to manage to have improvements and move it all along and link together. And naturally, again, in order to have a product produced, I cannot, need, cannot have it manufactured and tested. So there is software out in the market that will help us through digitization without using a single screw for the device or final product, and somehow we still can manage it and see how the product will behave. Here, Mazzarati, with the whole implementation, just see, as for time to market, this is uh, reduced by 30%, and, and the time to market went down from 30 to 16 months. Also, greater flexibility. We had an option for 70,000 combinations for this model. And based on that software, we can see whether the lines were properly implemented and properly optimized. So with all that software, what they did was by just adding one line to the production chain, and yet they increased productivity threefold by threefold. So all this, all digitation and huge amount of data is pointless unless we guarantee information. We need to take into account that we will be making choices based on the data we've gathered. So if data are not safe, are not secure and reliable, then the decisions we will make will be wrong. So where is cybersecurity at play? Well, at protecting all those data. Why? Why is it so important to consider cybersecurity? Well, 
both for protecting intellectual property for all the machines we have the know-how or producer have the know-how on how they produce and manufacture each product and this is to be protected then productivity this system needs to be working 24 hours seven days a week so if there is a cyber attack for service denial well uh, i can have great know-how but then i will not sell anyway then what about product integrity if i manufacture cars and the paint the body paint um, has some kind of problem when it comes to the paint composition it's pointless to manufacture so many cars when because of a cyber attack or because of a change in uh, the paint composition i will still take those cars back to the plant for remanufacturing and then reputation and finally just to wrap it up what seems offering for cyber security well deep defense this is defense sorry defense in depth based on IEC 62443 we implement security from design phase and as you see up there we have a series of services we have a third for some potential problems we can have in our pro products so we can detect them and solve them. And we also have interconnection with a large amount of certs from different countries. And we also have everything we need to help our clients have safe and secure systems. Thank you very much. Roman. Oh. I will not be using a slideshow, but I'll take the podium anyway for the pictures, because then I can tweet all those pictures, and so I want to be portrayed. So the chair introduced me. Thank you, Nsevi, for your invitation to you share some time with you. I move around. So it's not just something physical, but I do lots of things. I'm now developing the Galician network of Fab Labs. We are building up a network of Fab Labs. You might have heard of it. We have one in Galicia. We have a super hub. Now we are producing. Um, we are ha we actually have a, a stream of the largest 3D printer in Europe. We are building a beast in the office. Well, the shop. It is being streamed live. Uh, I don't know how it's doing because uh, I'm here, but we do this kind of things. For the last weeks, uh, we've been in Galicia and Vigo. Actually, we have some colleagues here from Hagen Beers, Antonio, Belen, where we had lots of people having to do with this. But especially, uh, it's interesting to mention that first edition, this is the second one, but first edition, there was this guy with a hood. He was 11, and he was highly interested in cyber security. And just a couple of days ago, well, yesterday, I was teaching some lectures the whole morning at an automotive company, getting the operators ready for the transition towards the industry 4.0. They are working with AGVs and the pilot plant is in Galicia. We have the PCA group. We have quite a potent automotive uh, industry there. We have the University of Vigo represented here. We have the chair, Telefonica chair, uh, introduced a couple of weeks ago, and they discussed discuss cybersecurity. We have some other colleagues also lecturing here at NCB. So we do lots of things. I try to be part of all of those. I'm a mentor. I'm the chair of the mentoring association in Spain. Well, actually, European association. And I'm mentoring this 4.0 project, especially for startups uh, that work on cybersecurity or somehow related to it. A couple of days ago came a guy by the Fight Lab, Fab Lab and I say he was a guy because he came with his white robe, his name is Thomas, and he had a suitcase, which was actually a, a drill box. 
and he had a sea probe. He had built it. He's 14, and he built it some couple of years ago. He works for Meteo Galicia, or cooperates with them, using the probe with, done with Arduino, made with Arduino, and with some plates that change Wi-Fi into long-range uh, Bluetooth. So all of this does something we see on on a daily basis. This is in Ponte Vedra, Svant Lab, and the same. We got kids who are seven, eight, coming from schools, getting these uh, virtual reality goggles, and they would use the, 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 the father's uh, cell phone and would have 360 vision, and they explain their own fathers and mothers how to do it. So this is a change happening in our society. And so these are trends, trends for the industry 4.0, but actually the trend is what's coming and what's happening so very fast because we have eight, nine, 10, 14 year olds. Even we have a 14 year old kid that has cybers, uh, has software against cyber bullying and he's studying telecommunications now. And he's coming around saying, what can I do? And so we said, Come together, all of you, join forces, because we don't know. The trend will be whatever you say. We will discuss, and actually, we were at the main room before discussing regulations, European views, and UN's views, uh, governments' uh, discussions with uh, regional governments in Galicia and Extremadura. I lecture everywhere about it, but the thing is, Actually, actually, the speed at which this is all happening and the meetings for hack and beers. We had a Bitcoin miner the other day and he was talking about cryptocurrency. And this is quite a mess, quite a mess, which uh, uh, has no clear rules and, and, and probably no one will tidy it up. And that's what's so much fun about it. What's going on there and how come we will be able to protect each other. And if you are in the industry, you need to protect your industry, your cell phones, your devices, cars. We are exposed. And what's happening here, again, is happening so fast and so intensely that it is so difficult to discuss trends. For me, a trend would be something about encouraging you, listen to those coming after you because it's amazing it's mind-blowing whenever i see the one who had the robe he's 14 and he was wearing the scientific robe and his parents are scientists as well he were they were on the boat on the antarctic and so they have been breastfed into that my my kid Sara, are you seeing me well she's in barcelona and she's got a phd or she's starting a phd on big data and she is very young and she's working on uh, algorithmic artificial, uh, artificial intelligence. Yes, she was best breastfed into it, but still I need to ask her, hi, honey, I'm gonna teach cybersecurity. So I go to her and ask her because she's up today. She knows about that. So we are raising people that are welcome into our world. And so that's what we need to do, the industry and see how we can tidy it up. Thank you very much, Ramon. Very interesting, very refreshing. And youth are, is the future. Good morning, everyone. First of all, I should like to thank Enise and Enzibe for their kind invitation, and especially for giving me the chance to share the panel with wonderful speakers. So my predecessors said that the industry 4.0 and evolution and revolution is up to all of us. And there is a new generation of people helping out. It is wonderful. But still, we also need to highlight who is who is holding most of the responsibility. Because when we share, when we say shared, it seems that the obligations are deluding away. And I think the focus here are manufacturers. Ignacio, coming from Siemens, uh, will be the focus of my intervention. Actually, when I was suggested to give a lecture or a presentation on the topic, I thought manufacturers were the key point. Uh, sorry, you cannot see that. Let's see if I can use it as well. You can see it now, can't you? 
So today we have five trends which manufacturers are what well, they are the key characters to cybersecurity specifically when it comes to automation and control systems. So it's clear that for some time now they are reaching into agreements with larger manufacturers for cybersecurity solutions such as Symantec or McAfee. Uh, this is good news because there were some problems in the past that have been solved luckily in present times. And they're also offering cybersecurity services, services which somehow are reasonable, but they also compete against traditional consulting cybersecurity agencies. Then there is a large number of services with all the flagship products, all the stock products, which is very good news. But again, we feel we need to um, streamline this capability to all the product lines available. And again, I've seen that on some slides on Ignatius' uh, lecture where he referred to the cloud and virtualization. He did not go into detail. But again, we feel these are two more trends that are up to date, especially for the Industry 4.0 and interconnected industry. As for agreements that I mentioned, these are two clear examples, two pieces of news that I got as I was getting ready for this event. Here we have uh, McAfee and Schneider or Siemens and Trend Micro. But there are so many more. We find niche solutions for industrial security, such as uh, Sightland Defense and others. As for services, I should like to use some more time here, because basically they're focusing on uh, ensuring that automation and control solutions that are offered have a series of uh, added services, added value services such as uh, early uh, warning of vulnerabilities, checking security bugs, or capability for backup, customized backup. And then uh, regarding all those agreements they are going into with security manufacturers, well, they are also offering software updates uh, and malware malware software, sorry, and they're even designing and deploying intruder detection systems. But what I'm most interested in is consulting services, which they are offering, by the way. And I feel they need to be there because they are paramount in designing all solutions, automation solutions. But they also need to take into account other stakeholders. As a matter of fact, they have awareness raising and training services, uh, changing insecure systems into secure environments, recovery after a disaster or a catastrophe, etc. So this is great. This is Siemens' example. We, I have another one for AEB, ABB, where they are adding new security options, low level at industrial environments. As a matter of fact, Siemens has this uh, module that is the 1500 CB series that has to do with the classic uh, S7 automated system where they inspect hardware to state, VPN detection, transfer file, safe file transfer, and also support in different protocols. That way they protect their whole automation uh, in the periphery. And I find this is a good trend, and which is worth highlighting. This is what happens with an automaton. automaton. And, uh, and this is another case by ABB, where as part of the Symphony Plus software, which is distributed control system for water treatment plants and power plants, which has a series of very interesting security capabilities such as authentication that is role based following the standard that you can see on the screen, which is a standard that Ignatius said is open source, which is a good trend, you know. And there is also support for. LDAP also set up uh, password policies, uh, host firewalls, uh, backups as well, log files and selective backups. It is based on Acronis, which is uh, quite common in this field. And then you can also have uh, control over over a session, an operator session, in case of an emergency, if you need some kind of 
extra permissions or permits rather. On the right side, you see the WannaCry. Of course, this could not be missing in this kind of uh, event. And this actually piece of advice letting know that WannaCry could have an impact because it's Windows based and it could have an impact on the whole Symphony Plus family. Yeah, I'm about to finish here. Uh, just one minute. As for virtualization, well, virtualization is one of the keys to cloud-based solutions and, as a matter of fact, is a trend in the industry, but it needs to be done properly. I find it is great because we have more and more solutions certified that are compatible with virtualized software systems, but there are some risks as well when it comes to cybersecurity. You are risking altogether because it's all hardware, so whenever we are to follow good segregation segmentation practices, well, it can have an impact. Um, we need to virtualize, yes, yes, that's for sure, you're cutting down costs, but we, you need to be reasonable about it. And then the, the, the trend, the, 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 the cloud trend, software as a service, or in, even infrastructure as a service, we have Microsoft or other companies, traditionally we're not here, but then they have IoT platforms and Zure and even Cortana, and these are solutions that are success cases. You just Google them and you see how they've managed to help out companies uh, increase efficiency in preventive maintenance, etc. There are also some cybersecurity problems, but since I need to leave the podium now, I will only refer to that during the question if you ask me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we move on to Angela. So first of all, I should like to thank Inziva for their kind invitation. I really appreciate it because we are here to discuss up-to-date topics that are very interesting throughout the whole value chain, citizenship, uh, users, and public administrations all alike. I currently work at CERIC. CERIC is a consortium of different research infrastructures bringing together, for example, synchrotrons or neutrons. We are based in seven different countries in throughout Europe, and we have 42 different research infrastructures. It's, it's not that I try to bore you with a description of the company where I'm working, but the idea is to highlight my interest in cybersecurity. We do not have connected infrastructures, but as you can figure out, since these are research infrastructures, we produce a large amount of data that we exchange. And uh, yet, yet, we are not in a position to have an industry point oh uh, policy amongst all uh, infrastructures, but that's the plan down the road. I'm a plan innovation manager. I've been for 10 years now. And cybersecurity, as we say, can be the solution to the loss in the value of what's produced by companies now. Product does not lie with the value, with the, sorry, the value does not lie with the product anymore, but with the uh, source code and the intellectual property, etc. So for us, producing so much knowledge, uh, cybersecurity has become paramount. But at the same time, I need to have a look. We all need to have a look at it from the point of view of open innovation. Industry 4.0 can be considered as as maybe the, 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 the paramount expression of uh, open connectivity is exchanging uh, knowledge and data, that's open innovation. That's the underlying philosophy for open innovation. Industry 4.0, it's just the best example of such. But, but at the same time, if we are to think of the cybersecurity tools or something that is critical, critical in order to have a proper secure 4.0 infrastructure, well, means that it cannot be a, a Double fold or double edged uh, tool or weapon, meaning that if we use uh, or implement a cybersecurity measure, it needs to be functional. 
for the data and knowledge exchange. What I mean is, I feel that about trends, everything I, I, I consider pushes cybersecurity technologies into onto the edge, but we it's flexibility and reliability. That's what we need for cybersecurity tools and technologies that are successful. Flexibility, because they need to adjust to very different changing environments in the globalized world and real time. Real time cars. A cybersecurity measure cannot block the information flow. It cannot block that information flow or exchange flow. And I feel that now the gaps that we need to breach on which uh, or what we need to favor as cybersecurity industry, we need to favor those technologies that allow for real-time knowledge and networks. That's what we call real-time visibility of our network. And then the other side that has been mentioned by my colleagues the holistic view. This need to be technologies which are in a position to face or tackle rather problems that are connected throughout wide infrastructures. And then we also have the real-time analysis, technologies that manage to analyze and look into problems on time. This recent example, we have a series of technologies where the Department of Security in the US, well, they've developed those and they're trying to transfer them into the market for private use. And there is this one technology that it has been implemented in jo at John Hopkins in order to analyze malware as it is running. These are the kind of technologies we are trying to find, or other technologies, as long as the Department of State uh, or Defense, sorry, DOD in the US, they're trying to market uh, another kind of technology, which uh, leads to a change in the output in documents made by Word or other standard software options. The kind of documents that we use currently for data exchange. And so we can change the design, the output, whenever there is a result with those subwords. And, and this is very interesting because we work with a huge amount of documents that follow using this, this sorry, documents using this software. So just to wrap it up, I feel the key words are flexibility and real time. And I feel this needs to be the axis around which we will move towards uh, focusing innovation on cybersecurity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you very much, Angela, for sharing your excellent experience with us. And now, Stefan, you have the floor. Hello, I would like to share with you the idea of a smart building and how we should look at it. We should look at it as a holistic part, integrated part of uh, Industry 4.0. First of all, I tell you what uh, smart buildings are like, the trends in this type of buildings, and how we should face up to that from a global cybersecurity perspective. First of all, smart buildings are buildings that have uh, IT system and equipment uh, aims at automation, control, lightning, intrusion alarms, uh, firefighting alarms, heating, etc. All these equipments and systems are interconnected and they are also functionally integrated and also they are connected to the internet. The objective of these buildings is just to them to meet the current regulations and the standards but also meet the demands of the market and demand of the users. Here I'm referring to comfort, security, connectivity, energy efficiency, operations and maintenance. Yet there is an issue in smart buildings 
that comes up in all sectors as a result of digitization. So here we have the traditional networks on the left. These are networks, a standalone network with their own telephony system, access control system, security system, audio video system, etc. In many cases, this uh, infrastructure is not digital but analog, and if digital, they were they had a very simple connection, probably just a phone connection to the outside. But all these vertical elements come together and are put into a common infrastructure on top of data networks where we hook on sensors, actuators, drivers, and on top of that common infrastructure, we build up uh, our services. Again, services, telephony, automation, automation security, audio, video, access control, etc. And all that is managed through a building management system, as we can see here on the slide. So we see integration and control of all these systems. And what happens here? Well, the problem in terms of cybersecurity is the following. We no longer have automation and control of the actual production, but what we had in the past uh, was a building protecting us against intrusion, bad weather, etc. Now we have a shell, a shell which is an active component of this industry 4.0. If we do not take care of that, it may end up being a threat instead of a protection. All these systems we have just seen and that make up smart buildings are connected, interconnected functionally speaking, they are interconnected in that very same TI infrastructure or IT infrastructure, so which makes it all the more complex and they also follow different protocols, different languages, some of them open source, others proprietary. The systems in many cases are each and every one of them connected remotely to the internet for maintenance 4.0 to um, and they also are made by manufacturers belonging to different sectors with different cultures with they are unrelated fully and then they follow different rules and different legislations in in it for each of these sectors as a conclusion cyber security and industry 4.0 require consideration of in smart buildings as an integrated part of industry 4.0 because we have new risks coming out regarding industrial production, the actual property, and the users. Well, I hope this is a good enough explanation about smart buildings and the problems that we have in terms of cyber security and how to face up to that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stefan, for your interesting presentation. It is interesting to see that face and industrial production and buildings are part of the productive uh, components of Industry 4.0. Now we will open up uh, debates. Now I'd like to open up the floor to the audience. I will start off with a first question to break the ice. And if someone in the room has a question, we'll feel free to go ahead. Well, the first question for this round table is the following. When we are talking about trends, I don't know how many of them have you been in the main hall in the presentation given by Gloria Placer. She is the head of the cabinet of the Secretary of State for uh, Information uh, Society and Digital Agenda. She told us about a proposal for the uh, regulation uh, of ENISA, European Network of Information Security Agency. So ENISA apparently will be ask will be creating, will be developing new standards for cyber security or just to adopt, embrace current standards. Of course, that will have a direct impact on Industry 4.0 because the elements of 4.0 industry are a component of critical infrastructure. So therefore, it looks like 
in the short term products to be installed in Industry 4.0 will be required to meet or to comply with certain security standards and regulations. So, my first question to the panelists is whether, how do you feel about that? Do you think this is the right way to resolve cybersecurity issues, which are the pros and cons, and what will be the impact of that? Because that will offer unquestionably competitive edge to some companies and not to others. Would that be a help to entrepreneurship and to innovation or not? Who'd like to answer? Elio, Ignacio, anyone? Well, I'm not only in favor of that certification uh, program or uh, Europe uh, to be carried out in Europe, and also not only with ERCIV, but ERCIV, which is a European reference for infrastructure protection, infrastructure protection. We are already working on that, on that scheme. There are several European teams. One of them is based in Germany, Italy, and Spain. And in Spain, we are working together with the CCI, the Center for Industrial Security, IP Plus as a laboratory, Cartagena University as a user, and we as a manufacturer. So I don't know whether ENISA would end up adopting these trend or these certifications uh, that I mean try to that are simply trying to certify. But we are all aware that there should be something, something there that will help us certify products. And all that will be positive, although it will not be enough. It is not a question of manufacturers only, it is a question that concerns us all. Here I'm talking about manufacturers, integrators, and users. All of us being here because there are very many bodies out there. They have lots of time, lots of resources, and lots of money. If we do not come together to face up to them and to survive, we will die. Well, I fully agree. Well, from a conceptual and global viewpoint, that is a positive step. Still, I believe that sometimes, well, we have uh, problems in the actual detail. Well, a key question for me is whether that certification scheme, which is will be positive because it will be coordinated centrally in Europe and will be harmonized in Europe. So the question is whether that is focused on to functionalities of cybersecurity or focused on implementation, failures in implementation of uh, cybersecurity. Well, automation and control uh, products or devices have to be uh, certified. If you add an additional layer of cybersecurity, when you add a patch, you would have to certify that again. Certification is expensive. You have to pay for it, and it's also time consuming. That entails a number of costs. Therefore, if we want to ensure that we are certifying a number of functionalities, I agree with it. But if we focus on certifying correct implementation of the software, of those functionalities, free of uh, failure, that would be also be perfect, but unfeasible in the short and medium term. OK, I could say more about it, but I just don't have the time. Right, so from my perspective, having a European certification instead of having different certification in each member state for different technologies is a positive step. Nowadays, there are some solutions out there that to be sold and in different member states have to go through different certifications, different processes. So therefore, having a European certification, in theory, would reduce some costs. That would be possible, uh, positive because of that. It would also be positive for SMEs. 
because this cost may have an impact on the PL of SMEs. I also would like to take this opportunity to mention the following whether that certification is mandatory. And if it is mandatory, for whom would it be mandatory? I feel that it should not be mandatory for the private sector. Well, the different thing is how companies uh, sell themselves to third parties. And I believe that if it is not mandatory, uh, well, it will be a problem if it is not mandatory for public companies. And then in this type of certifications, and when it comes to the developments of them, we have to take into account the decoders of the uh, stakeholders. So some stakeholders So, so what about the insurance sector? So, insurance sector suffering this type of uh, old risk insurances. We have to take into account these stakeholders when it comes to developing this European framework of certification. Well, I would like to say that I partly agree with it. Uh, of course, in critical infrastructures. But when it comes to the industry, when we are talking about small companies or micro companies, this is a complex issue because we are talking about certifying providers and products. But that would stop the fast, uh, well, the speed that we mentioned before. We are talking about open source, open hardware. If we limit that with uh, certification, with regulations, that will no longer be feasible. So we are saying that large corporations, large multinationals have a significant interest in, in global industry. And uh, Germany, the US are creating new industry with new devices, new equipment. And this is being developed in this large industry and also in public administration and also in the bank banking sector. But small companies, micro companies, which are abundant in Spain, are not uh, beyond that, are not, this is not applicable to them. They use what it is out there in the market. And if what is out there in the market is certified, OK. But if it is not certified, what to do with it? There is also a large gap there. So there is not enough training and qualification in the uh, personnel. So as it's been said before, there is a significant gap. Even in, we find it in the public administration, there is a gap in terms of uh, expertise in cyber security. Well, if we have that certified product, uh, OK, it's always welcome. But that will take time. That will not be immediate. What will happen in the meantime? Up until all that is certified. Well, as we say in Galicia, it depends. Well. Uh, then the level of certification, whether the certification is basic enough for what I do for my business. But that may also destroy digital transformation in the industry. So we have to get ready for that. But that certification should be uh, agile. So therefore, so that for the time being, that is inconvenient. So thank you very much for your opinion. So Stefan, how do you feel about it? Well, indeed, it is uh, having a certification for products and systems is advantageous. However, in the cases, cases such as smart buildings, in the smart buildings, we are not certifying a single system. We have systems of 15, 20 different typologies, manufacturers, sectors. Therefore, that would not be enough. Therefore, we need added value for this integration control, because all those systems are interconnected. The challenge is even greater. I'm not saying that certification is not a positive element. 
but we should be fast enough. Otherwise, the system could be attacked through automation and control systems, through cameras, through access control systems, or, for instance, elevators that are connected to the internet. All that can be uh, prone or open to attacks. So when we talk about integrated system, the cyber security is more global. We are not talking about smart buildings, yes, but also smart cities. This is a big challenge. So therefore, certifying products and procedures and services is not enough. We should see all the each case as an own threat, and therefore to find a unique uh, solution for that case. So would like anyone in the room would like to ask a question or make a comment? Well, you go to somewhere, you sell energy efficiency, which sells very, very well, everyone will buy it. But you will well, the, it is the person at operations who would buy it to you. So who will pay for that certification? So in terms of certification, a presence detector, a sensor, has to follow a category and a class, the UNE. So to me, the certification is not the certification issue is not that difficult. Okay, but anyway, question is who will pay for it? Well, everyone will pay for its thing, for what you buy. Yeah, well, we will have to pay whatever it takes, whatever it costs. So I always give the same example when I... So it is not me, it is a big wave that is ahead of us. The 4.0 uh, revolution started a few years back. We have to hurry up, we have to get ready, and we have to find a way to face up to it. Well, we cannot just stand still waiting for subsidies. That is over. Countries that are ahead of us or that are ahead are, do not, are not based on subsidies, OK? So that's the way it is. It is happening in Europe, OK? Well, that industry started off in France, not in Germany. These are the companies that are driving this new industry structure forward and forward. And we also have other actors, other players, being that anyone nowadays can manufacture anything. So. We have this open innovation. So the production does not take place only at factories, not anymore. So we should, we should not overlook that. And then also certification. As has been said before, we need certification. Certification should be there. But disruptive innovation, fast innovation follows a different pace. Therefore, well, things will continue, will go ahead, and then they will go through certification processes, but that certification process will follow a different pace. Well, the regulation of the ANISA proposal says as follows, and I would like to answer Angela's question. It says that the adoption of those certification schemes they say, should be voluntary. So it means that the market will decide on whether how to, to implement it. So, but we are very sure as to who pays for the lack of security, that is to say the users, and that's a question. Are we going to stop paying for that shortage of security, uh, well, perhaps because of initiatives of this kind? That could set a path for us to follow. OK, so we have time for one more question. OK, common criteria in the last 20 years have been a failure. 
common criteria in the last decade have been a failure for very many reasons. Amongst others, it was expensive. Uh, sometimes we make it late. For instance, a small company that is just created then needs to go into certification, doesn't have to do it because it is costly. It's not sure whether it will pay it off or not. So with regard to that European certification in an industrial scenario, could we and where we can learn from previous mistakes. I would like to hear from you, from each of you, how we can re-track, okay? Put this certification back on track, how we can redirect it. Well, I'm sorry, uh, we just don't have time. You are very much right. And this is the task that has been asked Enisa to carry out. Well, a quick answer. Legislation, etc., certification is always late. So our challenge is as follows. If we don't want to suffer attacks, crimes in the short term, each and every one of us has to find the right solution. And that certification of processes, products that comes after is welcome. But from my viewpoint, who pays for that? The company. Uh, yes, it's just an investment. It's just a cost. It is not an investment. Okay, the investment is just to go on with your business. Okay, this is just a, a cost. But if you don't pay for that cost, perhaps your operation would be uh, stopped or impacted, and you have to assess uh, well that risks. So very quick answer. Well, your question is very, very pertinent. I heard about it before, and as Ignacio mentioned before, I worked for ENISA when, after they produced the first uh, draft in automation and control. And everyone at that time said that common criteria was useless. So perhaps the way to fix that would be by having the end user defining a number of uh, standards, whether they are European or any other nature, and then to do fast testing on the part of uh, expert companies that help you check that. This is cheaper and faster than certification. And then for products that will be implemented in infrastructures, that is to say critical in terms of national uh, security, they should undergo certification. And then at the end of the day, we are not talking about protecting the business of the company. We are talking about pro securing or protecting the security of uh, public infrastructure. And then the government should pay for that. Well, that question will have us here for hours, very pertinent, very interesting, but we just don't have any more time. I would like to dearly thank all the panelists for sharing their thoughts and views with us, and thank you very much to everyone in the room as well.